PMI's new product, Vita C Feedlock, delivers medium chain fatty acids formulated specifically to address risk factors in feed. In our challenge studies, Vita C Feedlock addresses those risks, allowing pigs to maintain their performance and keep on track for our producers. Vita C Feedlock is formulated specifically to close the gap. To learn more, check out our website at pmiadditives.com and click the Vita C tab. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the meal, and uh, Mike's got a task ahead of us to, to keep us awake here to start with. But, but a great speaker with uh, Mike Porth. We're going to speak about managing through a lot of packer relationships and price discovery with some of his experiences, kind of looking through the past and, and going forward. And uh, part of that is really analyzing some situations in the world today, right, with ASF and the, and the scary situations that can disrupt our markets, COVID uh, relationships that we went through. Uh, experiences with force majeure and uh, issues with last year's disruptions and things there. So, but a little bit about Mike, if you don't know, um, based right here in Ames, uh, Story County. And Mike brings 35 plus years of pork industry experience to the corporate uh, world, uh, working, spending time with Smithfield Foods, Cargill Pork, and ConAgra in meat and pork procurement industry. Mike says he retired from the corporate world. And join the Partners for Production Agriculture as their COO with oversight to operations and personnel. Mike enjoys spending uh, time supporting county and state port committees in different capacities, along with providing a lot of social media uh, content with his different pork entrees that he enjoys. So welcome, Mike. We'll look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Colin. So um, first of all, uh, who's my two o'clock person? Kent, you're in charge of two o'clock. So that's today's a big day. Only four times a year we have the hogs and pigs report. So who set me up to be here during the hogs and pigs report? Um, I guess I'll talk to that person. So uh, the other thing is, how many of you had those wagon wheel size cookies? All right, so those are the people that'll be dozing off, plus Doug Schuler, who always does. And then next thing. Well, you were more exciting, Mike. I, I know, I know. So. <laughs> My other thing, before we get started, a pet peeve. So, pet peeve is, today what we had for lunch, ribs, pork loin, that's meat. That's considered a meat product. No different than, you know, beef and, and, and our poultry friends. And what's a pet peeve of mine is when we see lab and plant-based protein called meat. And I think if we're going to get ahead of it, Let's call it what it is. It's a protein source. It's an option for those who prefer that. But to me, it's not a meat product. So I challenge each and every one of you to call it what it is, if you believe in it, and you believe in the great industry that we're involved with. So um, with that, we'll get started. Uh, disclaimer, even though I'm not a trader, if there's anything, Partners for Production Ag, we're a trading firm. So we deal in commodities with clients. So if there's anything that's construed as, ah, I need to be long orange juice or short corn oil or what have you, and you trade that and you lose money, that's your own fault. So as long as everybody understands that, um, I will, from a pointer standpoint, probably go this way. Not saying I can't go that way, but I'll try to be uh, right on as we go through some of those. So I thought to set the stage to where we're at as we talk about packers and, and pricing, we'd go through a little economics. And what's any better than start the economics a year ago, where were we during COVID? You know, we had hope as we started the first quarter of last year that, hey, we knew we we're going to have some more supply. We knew we had shackle space growing. But, you know, we did have some hope. And then we went into oh, toilet paper, sanitizer. How many of you got some toilet paper left over from a year ago? Come on, be honest. So now, for those who didn't have enough toilet paper, I hope you had enough sanitizer. So then we went into um, the fear. The Dow closed 18,213. That's what, 15, 16,000 below where we're at today. Um, and we had a bunch of bear markets, uh, supermarkets of meat. Why did we have it? Well, we'll talk about that. I'm sure most of you either felt the pain or understand why that happened. 
And then we kind of just went into a sheer panic. What's going to happen going into the fall? What are we doing with all these extra pigs? So that is a year ago, and hopefully we've moved to better times. And at 2 o'clock, Kent will let us know what it looks like for a little bit. So let's just talk about China, the spot hog market. So um, this, is, this would be in wands, and so as you can see, they had a great market back here. They're fighting ASF, and really had a good market. And if you go into this spring, we saw this market fall off, the Chinese market. And people are saying, what's going on? Oh, they got bad ASF, and they've got too many pit, you know, ASF, and everybody's trying them to get them to market you know, before they died, kind of like a year ago, two years ago, and saying they're just putting pressure on the market. Who would ever think from 2017 to now that you went from 45, 50 million sows down whatever the number is, 30 to 50 percent, and you rebounded by this timeline. So we'll talk a little bit more on that. But what was one leading edge, so this would be the piglet price. And the piglet price stayed fairly good up till about early March. And that, what that told us is probably ASF, got a lot of pigs going to market, get them lighter, clean them up. But the piglet price, people are still wanting to buy them at a market. Well, that piglet price started falling off middle into March into now, and maybe there is some thought that there's probably, um, they've built their herd to some number um, that I still don't believe in, but I will say it's rebuilt better than maybe what we thought. So let's go into U.S. pork exports. China's been kind of the leading. Uh, Mexico, we think by the end of the year, it's going to be clearly the second, maybe overcome. There's some things going into uh, the end of the year. Brett Stewart, and I've got this in another comment in the future, but I just will say it. Brett Stewart with Global Agritrans. Some of you might listen to him, hear him. We get the opportunity to have him on 7 o'clock every Monday morning. Two weeks ago, he brought his export numbers for China from a half a percent down for the year to about 4% down. And then just this last Monday, he brought it down to 4 to 6% down. So he has some concerns where China's going to be as we go into um, the end of the year. Um, he had a third quarter number that was down 9 to 11%. Um, this is just China. Um, and the overall effect back to the business, uh, China's a big player. And them and Mexico kind of carry the weight. But I also say Colombia and there's some other markets that have been growing. Our pork, pork board and others, USMEF, have done a great job to keep supporting growth in those other markets. But we have to understand where the meat and potatoes is made in exports. And I'm going to say it's, it's the, the China, the, the um, Japan, and Mexico markets are clearly the key drivers. So uh, this is from a revenue standpoint. So this is putting the WAN converted to a carcass weight. This is using a two-day CME index in the U.S. So you look at, from the left, China's peak numbers were late summer, early fall of 17. Um, early in 19, they started talking about the severity of ASF. That's when... Their market started taking off as lackluster at first, kind of like what I talked about uh, earlier. Um, you've got um, people who are just selling any hog that was alive to rather than dead. And so what their goal was, that's why we had a little you know, steadiness, and then the market kind of took off. At the first noise of us hearing about it, our market took off. But this is kind of over time, and then you had COVID-19 in China, and then China gave it to us three months later. That's kind of a joke, if you believe they did, but there's a little news out there about that. But we got it three months later. You saw their market. You saw our market.
but they've kind of merged together here in the last 30 days. So the China market right now from a cash standpoint would be below cost of production. First time in quite a while. Um, and our market's in pretty good shape. I haven't heard what the market's closed at. Five minutes, Kent, before the big report's out. Um, but this gives you a timeline with some activities of what's going on. And so again, you look at this period, as I said, you know, conspiracy theorist, you know, did they, have they just liquidated a lot of pigs because of more activity in ASF? Or have they grown um, their numbers to the point that they're supplying what consumers are eating over there along with the exports? Um, so time will tell, and I'm sure we'll hear more down the road. So this is cold storage. When you look at a bright spot, it wasn't very bright a year ago from a market, but it did support where we're at today, cold storage. So the red line would be 2020. We started shutting down plants, didn't have supply. We had a shelf space that was empty. So they had to pull from reserves. Traditionally, we're seeing uh, where traditionally we would see cold storage to be in the 600 to 650 million metric, and it came down into this 400 to 450. And it's held there pretty steady. All the big drop, you know, in May, June, they pulled, and they just haven't been able to get back to those reserves to be able to pull from. So that has stayed fairly steady. And again, this just came out Tuesday afternoon. Um, this has all the information and again showed the same. We're at about 450 million metric tons in cold storage. And I, say, I would call that is favorable to us as pork producers and the industry. Um, the key areas, so total hams would be on the left, total bellies on the right. So what this would tell me as far as the bellies, we're in the time of year where bellies are pulled, utilized a lot in the summer for a lot of different condiments, for sandwiches, what have you. Um, so bellies is having a hard time getting back. But the hams is kind of following trend lines of five-year averages and previous year's averages. And does anybody know why this trend grows in inventory into September? Why are we growing ham stocks into that time period? Anybody know? for November and December holidays. Those who process hams, the spiral hams, holiday hams, they need to be building inventory all the way into here to have enough supply for those holiday seasons. So that trend line, you know, yeah, we're almost at where we were a year ago, but understand overall stocks were down 30, 35%. Um, a year ago. So, but that trend line should follow um, because of what we stated. So, consumer level meat, uh, um, meat and pork demand has been great. Um, you look at per capita, it's grown. Um, you look at, so when you look at this and you say from a retail standpoint, we've done a phenomenal job supporting pork. Number one, you've had a price, you got a uh, price point that support it, but now food service is opening up. So as we go out as individuals or as, as with friends or what have you, from a retail, we go out, Kent and I buy a box of loins. You might just buy a whole 10 pound loin. Um, so you're buying for multi meals, multi opportunities. But when we go out and eating with friends, unless you're Doug Schuler. You're just buying one meal at a time. Doug buys an extra one, puts it on the expense report, and then takes it home so he's got dinner that night. So, sorry, Doug. Um, so, as we roll into the U.S. opening up, as we roll into food service being a bigger and bigger part, as we see this stadium across the uh, parking lot from us have 61,000, What's going to be the difference? You know, there'll be a lot of people buying multi products uh, for tailgating, but as food service opens, you know, 
What is that trend going to be like? We think, not because of flavor, not because of price, we just think we're going to probably move a little bit less product as we go in the second half of the year. Um, we talked about shifts, uh, hog slaughter. This is from Dr. Uh, Steve Meyer, our on-staff uh, economist. He still thinks hog slaughter will be within 1% of 20. Um, Kent, you got that pre-hogs pigs report yet? Okay. Um, we think the U.S. breeding herd will grow very little this year due to feed cost, much higher building and material cost, and then guild availability. I mean, you think about just from a genetic standpoint, availability, and this would make me think how did China grow so fast with the availability of genetics that are out there. So, um, you know, when you look, and then even though we've seen those who follow the futures, I've got a daughter building a house, Hasn't locked in the price, uh, and she said, uh, but her husband's watching the lumber futures, and it's come down to buy 55%, so he's happy. Um, I don't think it's going to affect their, hog, their, their house costs, but he's mentally at least feeling better about it. So uh, what will happen with exports, especially in China? As I mentioned, Brett Stewart revising downward, um, you know, Key development will be this fall, what, what is going on with their piglet prices as we talked about. If that starts taking off, that might tell us um, there, there is a need and maybe the supply is not in the, the grow finish uh, area. So um, Japanese buyers are screaming about prices. Mexico is good, but prices may become an issue. But after the last couple of days, my data had to be in. I think Tuesday I sent it in right after the cold storage, so I don't have the close of what happened Tuesday and Wednesday or today. So, um, um, Pat, so now we're going to go into packer capacities, relations, and future. What's the future going to be like? Um, good place to stop. Do we have? We do. Go ahead, Kent. So breeding herds 97% of the year ago. 3% down. Estimate. Estimates were like, especially the heavy category, the low, low end of that was 90%. Yeah. So this is, yeah. I, I would say this is going to be a little bearish for the. Bearish to what the analysts had yeah. said on that. Right. So, so you got it. Thank you, Kent. That's three minutes off the record what the hogs and pigs, but across the board, about 2% down versus a year ago. Two and three. Good. So let's talk about packers. So we got to understand at the end of the day, it's a relationship. As much strain as you might have had last year or years in the past with your packer and your relationship, they want the same as you. They want it fair and equitable. Understand they have a job to do also. So you have to treat it as a business. I understand you have relationships that are there long-standing, probably before that, that buyer you're dealing with is there, but we need to shake hands, feel good about it, do your homework, work with somebody who can help you understand the historical on those markets. You know, but we can say on historical and those who are in it every day, times have changed. How much value do you put on that history as you make decision on a two, three, or five-year agreement. So um, we'll talk a little bit about this. Um, so tomorrow's packer supplier relationships. Packer wants relationships with independent suppliers. I'm telling you, they do not want to grow any more of their own pigs. That's the farthest from their mind, with the exception to maybe some multiplication to control that. They truly do not want to grow their, their own production. 
um, you know, to, today's agreements were signed three to five years ago. Dynamics of the markets have changed. I know there's some packers out there that want to take the price discovery lower, but understand it's changed. And we'll talk about what's changed to make that happen. Um, force majeure, I'll talk about this also. The reality, last year, force majeure, if anybody had one served on them, it's the first time in 35, 40 years I've ever seen one be enforced. Um, Must-haves, working with multiple customer packers. I'm a firm believer if you market 10,000 head or more, you need to have two packer relationships. I don't care if one's an hour further down the the road, it cost you an extra $200 in freight. Think of last year of those who had one relationship, and that was the relation of that packer. That, and they didn't plan on it, but they were down a week, two weeks, four weeks. Got a plan for that. Um, uh, pricing mechanisms that support risk mitigation. I think Kent, and if there's any other bankers in here, would say try to work on a price discovery that minimizes basis risk uh, on, as you're doing your agreement. Um, deliverable volumes with uh, plus minus on both sides that we're uh, accountable to, common pitfalls. I think we as producers forget who, who our customer is. You treat them as the big bad packer. I was on that side. They're your client. They're your customer. As mad as we sometimes get, they probably get the same way. It's a working relationship. It's a business. You need to do at least one, but I say two times a year, you need to just do an re overall review. How are my numbers doing? How's my yield doing? Try to find those things that they really like that you're doing. Use that in the back of your mind for negotiating the next year. You know, lean uh, weight premiums, discounts. I'm telling you, in all the years, producers leave a lot of money on the table. You know, when the market's $120, you might say food scraps. Last year, when the market was $30, it was 5%. Look at who you're delivering to. That's why several people would have a packer that maybe takes a, a heavy in that first cut, maybe that second cut. And then that person who they'll send a load to that's kind of that clean out, that looks good. You know, packer, if he got one load every week of the year, that means as much, to, that means more to him than that guy who sells, you know, uh, gets wean pigs on an 18 week schedule and he would go two or three weeks and doesn't have any pigs. Think about it. That plant is running five days, five and a half days a week, 52 weeks a year. So think of consistent volume, what have you, from that standpoint. Uh, over deliver your promise via agreements, flexibility, logistics, and weight. You know, logistics. You got a packer that has three plants, make sure he knows, hey, if something happens to that plant, feel free to take my pigs to the next one. I'd like to get freight subsidy for that, but at least talk in business terms with them. At the end of the day, it's a business. Who do you feel comfortable going to business with? And, and those relationships were strained. They were strained a year ago. Um, force majeure, unforeseeable circumstances that prevent someone from fulfilling a contract. The first one came out in Financial Times out of Beijing, February 27th. China issues record number of force majeure certificates. I remember seeing that, and I'm saying it's a matter of time. And this was even before we got in the middle of March and saying, oh, shit's going to break loose. I was on my way to uh, Arizona for a week off playing golf with the buddies. And here's my concerns. We had to wear a mask when we got in Phoenix. We're hearing from the golf courses that said, you might not be able to play golf for four days. All the baseball fields were shut down, and we couldn't go out to eat. But we got it all taken care of, and it was a fun trip. But, but we did not know five days later if we were going to be able to fly home or rent a car. 
And so, um, and I want to say it was probably May, June when the force majeure started coming out in the U.S., but it's, it's a business. They had to protect themselves. They could not take it. And they did not want to activate that clause. So what's happened in the packing timeline? You got to almost go back 20 years ago when uh, premium standard was kind of the new wave, new age plants built. Uh, and then we saw Indiana Pack. We saw Seaboard, Rantoul, which is now uh, part of the Trimrite group. Um, and then we started seeing the Triumph Foods um, in St. Joe. And then so what's happened? We saw, saw the markets. We saw, what, close to 48,000 come online, really, 17 and 19 and 20, Lynch came on. And we're like thinking, so let's talk about Packer relationships. And I think, and then we got, I'll back up. And then we got Holstone that was announced last Monday, 2025, possibly a new plant. They bought land. As an independent producer, you'd say you feel good, and if, especially if you're part of that 200-producer two, cooperative. So um, I'm going to come back to this on some things that have happened, but in a nutshell, let me talk about it right now. In 2014, we had PED. And Packers, if you had a price discovery coming up, 40% of the hogs were affected. We were worried the next year, the other 40 to 50% is going to be affected. If you're a packer in my shoes, we're going to say, make sure we get pigs tied up. So pretty aggressive on price discoveries. Get in the 15, 16, news of these new plants coming on, SDF, Clemens in Michigan, Prime Pork in Wyndham, and in Prestige. You as a packer saying, protect our base. You know, in business, you talk about protecting your base, your core clients, that, that top tier. And so you stayed pretty aggressive on price discoveries. But we didn't expect that we would fill those plants as fast as we did. And they got filled fast. So now, last two years, I'm going to say price discovery... Um, Today, the last two years have dropped off. The pack, packer is saying, got enough pigs. There's enough pigs coming. We're in good shape. Um, we need to start lowering our cost. So it's all about timing. And so if you have two packer relationships, you're selling to two packers, make sure they're on different timelines, not at the same timelines. So... Um, and we'll talk a little bit more, uh, but we saw some pretty aggressive uh, price discoveries up to the last couple of years. And now the packer is coming to you through that great relationship you've got with them and saying, hey, we need to rethink this. And um, you're not liking what you're hearing because you're comparing to where you're at. Now, being in that, in that side, I will say most packers have what they call buckets of price discovery. So they kind of, you know, they've got some cash, they got some blended, they got some off the index. It kind of gives them an even flow of cost of their product coming in, and they like to keep that. You know, whatever percentage in whatever bucket, each packer is different based on their, their product sales out of those plants or, or their brands. So, um, but it's, um, it's changed. And so I remember my first proposal before I left in July of last year with a couple of producers and, you know, it was $10, $15 a head behind. I've had producers since tell me more than that. That's kind of a shock. Wake up. And especially if you're selling $30 to $50 hogs last year per hundred weight. So I still firmly believe it, timing was terrible. Timing was terrible for you as a producer 
timing was terrible for the Packer too. It's, but again, remember what I said, it's business. The opportunity came along and they're saying, we need to save some cost. And they've had costs go up quite a bit. So this is just weekly harvest. What's happened since fall of 16. So this would be daily along the left. So the blue and the right just shows what we've done on a weekly harvest. So with, with the, the onslaught of those plants. So this here, this goes back. Heck, I used this uh, a few years ago with um, Mike Nagy. I uh, was in a meeting and he wanted a slide that shows the competition of of Packers in the state of Iowa and surrounding states. The black, the black ones would be all the new plants that come on in the last four or five years minus Laverne. You know, the green ones I think would be Tyson, the red ones would be Smithfield, the blue ones would be JBS, and the other colors would be the other ones. So when you truly look at this, you'd say, gosh, there's pretty good competition if I'm in Iowa especially if you're in northwest Iowa and southwest Minnesota, South Dakota, Nebraska corridor. Now, the flip side a year ago when Sioux Falls was down for four weeks and, and Worthington was down for a couple weeks, you're probably saying, eh, wrong area to be in. But that's just the way the marbles rolled. And they didn't want to be in that situation either. So, um, so. Total slaughter for this year, uh, this red line would be 2.768 million. That's our daily capacity. Do you remember uh, Brad Frecking talk, Dr. Frecking talking this morning about uh, some changes in those six plants in line speed? That's 85,000 head a week that's going to affect us. That's where this green line comes in. So I think we've got, yes. So we'll talk. Um, Capacity of the five of the six plants will affect us by 85,000 head. So, you know, at the, we're going to go from a 278, I'll call it, down to a 268. Uh, and we're going to have a few more pigs coming on this fall. In my mind, production will pick up versus a year ago when we were possibly euthanizing. Um, you know, this is going to be a big deal. So these plants, what we're saying is, through USDA's new swine inspection system, cannot run more than 1,106 an hour. Some exceptions might be the Monmouth plant, Smithfield's Monmouth plant runs two lines, so each one's treated separate, so they'll get more on a per hour basis through. So these are areas that we just need to be conscious of. Knowing that as you go into this fall, that we're going to lose some capacity. And then you talk about what Dr. Fracking talked because employees this morning and their plant at SDF has gone from 21,000 down to 17,000 because of their lack to get employees. How much more is that taken off? So a lot of food for thought. Um, Recap, supplier, packer needs. Really, they all, I think a packer and the producer have the same needs. It's relationships, it's logistics to where your, your business or your buy is at and the price discovery it costs to get the supply or you to sell your supply to them. Maybe a little different meeting, you know, but really we've got the same, same goals. Summary, packer and producer have same goals with different meaning to their business. Again, it's a business. Don't take anything personal. They have one to run, you have one to run. I was with a producer yesterday and he said, I've been doing business for 20 years with this one packer. We've gone back and forth four times. Each side, four times. That's some negotiations. And he said, I finally had to tell my relationship with that packer that please use my, my, uh, my spots for somebody else. I won't be coming back. That, that was tough for him. But that's the reality of it. Okay. 
Let's talk about price discovery. We've gone over some. So pre-2015, remember I talked the PD era? We had cash, cut out, cut out blends, negotiated. PD area, we kept plans full for the future. The packer wanted them. He kept, stayed aggressive on price discoveries if you're a good negotiator. If that relationship was well enough that, that you treated it as a business and you could negotiate that way. Uh, what I call the new plant era, and then the last 24 months. Revenue streams or price discoveries, there's cutout versus cash. I hate cash. Cutout versus two-day CME index. Cutout versus nearby CME price. Cutout versus a blended, which would be cutout and a cash. Nearby CME or the two-day CME index. Those are revenue streams that are out there. Again, your goal is a revenue stream that aligns with your ability to mitigate risk and minimize basis. That's how, in my opinion, you need to be looking at it. Price discovery discussion, we kind of talked about some of these. Um, I'm on the 10-minute warning, is that right? Good. Uh, so here's just some price discoveries. Go back to the first reported ASF, again, August of 18. Uh, China export bookings, this was a huge deal. March of 19, our market took off. Uh, the Chinese, uh, this would be nearby, six, nearby and six months out. So the nearby would be the blue, so that would be the upfront. Today we're in the July, and the six months out would be the December. So that's what this chart is saying. What is the six months out and the nearby futures doing? And you see this market took off. We had the opportunity to hedges, hedge, and then we saw the nearby fall off. Um, so, and then the market do what it is now. And we've had some great opportunities to lay off some hedge. So, but, you know, this COVID time was tough, not only for us, but for others. This here, this is two days old. These prices are not this high. Uh, but what I would say is these red prices would be all of the calendar year 21 futures prices. And if we've already closed them, it would be the close. The gray ones would be calendar year 2022. And then these down here is comparing them all to the index. And all I want to show is we've had opportunities to lay off risk if we haven't drank all the Kool-Aid. And that's the critical part. So bases, I talked about bases. So this is looking at the index, the negotiated 203, national daily negotiated, and then the cutout. The, the negotiated 203 is the orange, uh, the cutout would be the gray, and then the index would be the blue. You see the gaps, we kind of got wider, even though a little bit longer, but we've got a little wider. This is what we're trying to manage when I talk about basis. What price discovery helps you um, mitigate risk, minimize basis um, to the CME? And the index would be the closest one that would relate to how the futures roll. These are the different types of uh, formulas. There's negotiated. What percent of the pigs are sold on a negotiated market today? Anybody have a guess? Less than 1%. Probably a dozen people probably do the bulk of that. And, you know, I've been a firm believer of the negotiated, even though last year you would have got them stuck up your tail because nobody could take them because they couldn't get all the pigs harvested, but this is how we control our destiny. Right now, those, that less than 1%, they're the ones who's negotiating for these markets the last 75, 90 days, whether you realize it or not. Very few hands. So there's type one, negotiate. Type two would be anything associated to a futures or options. Type three, which is the most common, would be blends, uh, cutout, cash, Anything that's a blended or formula type market. Uh, and then other purchases could be a cost of production, could be a niche. There's not hardly any 
cost of production, most of niche. You know, we, so a comparison of that would be kind of like the, the paling type and some group housing are out there and then a negotiated formula. So I'm going to people, so here shows less than a percent are on negotiated. The fastest growing one is the packer sold. And it makes reason. You got cold water, you got pipe stone or whole stone, and you got prestige all converting from being a producer to a packer. So those have to be converted to a different formula. Uh, national weighted average cash market. Again, you look here, here's the blue. I think this 14 would be the green. I'm telling you, less than 1%. Very few have, are the reason this market is pushed up. To the point where it is. Um, this one here is just a high low per trading month. So this is each trading month from uh, February, the February futures and calendar year 18, all the way through next December of 22. And um, green would be the high, the red would be the low, and if it closed, what it would be. The yellow through here would be Iowa State's cost of production. Don't laugh at me, Kent, but that's the number we used. Um, and then up here, we did take the cost of production. I think this is for 21, spring of 21, um, 75 to $85. All I want to point out is there's some great opportunities to manage risk, mitigate risk. Um, USDA average cutout. It's been on a screamer. Yes, it's down. It's fallen off to about here. The last couple of days, I've got four minutes. Uh, Canadian slaughter. I want to bring this up. Little people have noticed this. How good could the market been in this May, early June time period if we weren't bringing any Canadian supply? Whether you realize it or not, we we saw a skyrocket. Why was it? Because they had an Ali Mail strike, Valley Junction in the far uh, east. Sofina was down because of COVID. Um, 30,000 head per week normally going to Quebec from Ontario. So it was a backlog. So they were sending them into those northern plants. Um, we've kind of gone over some of that. How do I offset risk? Traditional tools, the futures. Uh, cutout came out last year. We haven't seen the, uh, the use of it like we wish. We firmly believe in it, but we need more activity. But the insurance, my favorite tool, this, if, if we haven't, uh, I'm not going to talk. The federal price and margin life insurance. Is anybody using the tool, LRP or LGM? Okay. If you have clients, you need to ask clients. If you're an allied industry, you need to ask your clients if they're using it. If they're not, this is a freebie. They've got to. I mean, it's a subsidized put on the LRP. Um, it's, it's a no-brainer from our standpoint. It's, redu it's reduced trading with our clients, but I don't care. Joe will be the first one to say uh, producers need to be looking at this tool. Um, let's bring it together. So I'm going to say China, China, China. That's the top priority. Labor, labor, labor. You can't find it. Don't matter where you're at, where you go in any restaurant, any business, any retail, if there's not a sign up, they're lying. Um, fall 21 capacity, what will it be like, especially with uh, the new ruling, U.S. De demand, and then, you know, Prop 12. So we're backing off our capacity. We've got Prop 12 that was mentioned this morning by Wyatt that we only have uh, roughly 4% of the sows, 250,000 qualified into a state that is 14% of our domestic demand. When are we going to realize, our, is this rule going to be in place? When will we be in a, in a situation to say, okay, we don't have to worry or do we have to worry? Because you th throw on the capacity issue, backing off the plants, the Prop 12, and then 
is China going to keep taking supply at the pace that they have been? And other export. Um, we need to manage our risk. Um, I'm going to say this, and I've been saying it for three years. We're one morning from, from waking up and having African swine fever here. If we don't have risk mitigation, we have nobody to blame but ourselves because we've been talking about it. So uh, I leave this. I've used this several times. I'm old enough to remember these days up here. Um, we've got to be conscious of what people want to do. Food service is going to open. Um, and um, we've got to understand um, that, you know, the, where we're at, where you're at, at your age, and how you want to enjoy meals with friends. We're not going to go back to this. We're going to see a lot of this. But um, there will be changes. Prop 12, pin gestation, what we saw in beta agonists. There will be some neat niches still yet to happen. Is it organic, antibiotic free? There's some of that. Veg fed, pasture raised. You know, how is genomics, gene editing, and semen sexing going to play into it? We don't know. There's some people playing in that arena. But there will be competition. Just might not, it might be a little different than our parents' past. So, and I think we have to show empathy and show concern. There's people that don't have a source to buy good meat, whether even protein. So my goal is pork. I enjoy beef. Poultry's okay once every two months. Fish, my wife says I need to have that more often. But the plant lab and cell protein, um, I'll let you guys all judge that. I think that's all I got. I apologize. I ran two minutes over. Um, Unless there's a real quick question from anybody. Um, Colin, thank you for the opportunity. Kent, thanks for helping out, bringing in the, the, the markets. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around at the end of the day.